Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want, conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime vlogs, so if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe and if not, totally chill. You do not have to subscribe to have a good time. We are just here to talk some true crime, do some makeup, and for today's case we're going to be talking about the case of Brittany Kilgore. Now there is a lot to get through so we're just going to hop right into it. But before getting into the rest of today's video, I do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Rocket Money. And now recently I just bought myself a new car because my last one was literally dying out on me, but when I was trying to save up for that new car, it was extremely difficult because not just saving up money for a car but saving up money for literally anything is extremely difficult when you're trying to manage your monthly subscriptions your bills and on top of all of that trying to keep a good credit score so you can get a good car in the first place there's just a lot of factors that go into it and it can get very confusing and very stressful very quickly but thank you to rocket money all of that stress is now gone rocket money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less the personal finance manager allows you to manage your subscriptions, lower bills, monitor your credit score, and build your savings all in one place. Rocket Money is trusted by over 3.4 million members and counting, including myself. And one of my favorite things about Rocket Money is that not only does it keep track of your credit score, it also gives you tips and tricks on how to raise your credit score. And on top of all of that, Rocket Money will send you notifications every single time there's like an important change to your credit score which I find so so convenient because when it comes to my credit score it's not something that I keep up with on the daily usually I just check my credit score every once in a while and sometimes that can be a little dangerous if there's like an important change to my credit score that I didn't know about but thank god rocket money is here and they can help you out with that another really really cool thing about rocket money as well is that you can definitely tell rocket money is for you because they have this feature where they literally literally help you lower your bills. All you need to do is upload a photo of your bill and Rocket Money can help you save money on your cable and phone bills, your internet bill. And those are just the features that you get for free. Rocket Money also has premium options so you can even get more than that. And if you guys want Rocket Money for yourself and to unlock all of their insanely helpful premium features, all you need to do is go to rocketmoney.com slash Haley Elizabeth or click my link down below. And once once again, thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. Now back to your video. In a town with a population of around 30,000 people named Fallbrook in California, which is about an hour away from San Diego, there was a couple by the name of Brittany and Corey Kilgore. Brittany and Corey Kilgore were actually born and raised in Rolla, Missouri, but had moved to California recently because uh, Corey was in the military. A little bit of backstory on Brittany Kilgore. Brittany Kilgore was, as I said, born and raised in Missouri, but she was actually born in St. Louis before later moving to Rolla, Missouri. As a kid, Brittany was described as the goody two-shoes of the group. She never really got into trouble. She never really drank or smoked. She also went to church every Sunday and Wednesday. She was overall a really, really good kid, and it's not a bad thing to, you know, follow the rules and play by the rules, and that's exactly what Britney did. She was very, very smart, very mature for her age. She just didn't really have interest in going out and partying. She mostly just stayed inside and worked on her education. And then one day when she was 18 years old and she was at church, that is when she would meet a guy by the name of Corey Kilgore. It was said that when the two of them first met, they immediately hit it off for basically talking as if they had like known each other for a super long time. The couple were were just madly in love with each other so much to the point where a few months into their relationship when both of them were 19 years old they decided to get married. Since at this point they were both graduated from high school that is when Corey had gotten the news that he needed to go out to California and live on base because he was in the Marines and so since Corey and Brittany didn't want to do long distance they just decided to move in with each other. They moved into a house in this place called 
Camp Pendleton and they moved there at just 19 years old and at this point again they had only been married for maybe like a month meaning they only known each other for less than a year. And surprise surprise moving across the country with someone and marrying that person that you've only known for less than a year is not really a good idea and so because of this Corey and Brittany's relationship started to fail quite quickly. They started to get into a lot of fights all the time. Corey was never really home because as I said he was in the Marines so he was either on base or just sleeping because he was exhausted. Brittany wanted to go out there and live life but she was basically forced to be a military wife and stay at home. Three years into their relationship when Brittany was 22 years old that is when she just realized that she had enough of their marriage. She just felt so left out because as I said Brittany was the type of girl that grew up and followed the rules. She you know never really went out and partied and drank but now that she's older and she sees like everyone else around her doing it it makes her want to do it as well but she unfortunately can't really go out there and party like a normal 22 year old because she was stuck as a military wife and so one day when Corey was stationed in Afghanistan that's when Brittany filed for divorce. She booked a flight on April 17th 2012 in order to fly back home to Missouri and stay with her parents for the time being because she still needed to like get all of her stuff out of her and Corey's house and her plan was to get all of her things packed up and moved out of the house before Corey got back from Afghanistan. Her flight was on April 17th and then April 17th came and went and her family received no word from Brittany. They didn't even receive like a text message saying that she was on her flight or that she was on her way home. The family just couldn't get in contact with her. And so the family is thinking, okay, well, maybe something happened at the airport. So let's make sure that she's okay. So they attempted at calling and texting Brittany multiple times, but there was no response. They were calling for days. And then all of a sudden, one day when Brittany's mom had called Brittany, Brittany's phone actually picked up. But on the other line was not Brittany. It was a stranger. He said that he just found this phone on the side of the road and so he went to like the most recently called and the most recently called was Brittany's mom and so he just called that person and that's where he's at now. So Brittany's mother instructed this stranger to just give the phone to the police. And so when the police arrived they did confirm that this was the phone of Brittany but what was really odd about this was that Brittany's phone was actually found about an hour away from Fallbrook. And so when this phone was found, that is when they decided to file a missing persons report for Brittany. And from looking at text message conversations, the police found that Brittany was actually supposed to go on a dinner date cruise with a Marine by the name of Louis Perez. And so when the police find this, Louis is obviously brought into questioning to try to figure out what was going on that night. Louis was explaining the night and he said that that night, him and Brittany were indeed supposed to go on a dinner cruise but unfortunately when they got there they showed up a little late and when they got there the boat had already left. So we ended up dropping off Brittany at the front entrance of like this dinner cruise place while he went and found parking and then when he did he came back but Brittany was gone. He said that he didn't really you know pry or anything he just kind of assumed that maybe Brittany like got cold feet and went away or maybe she she stormed off because she was mad that they showed up there late and she was looking forward to it. He didn't really know why she left. He just knew that she was gone when he got there and so after that he just went home. And so the police start asking Louie, well if Brittany had just up and left, why didn't you attempt at calling or texting Brittany? Because they clearly see from the phone conversations that Louie never attempted at texting or calling Brittany. And so to this he just says that he didn't call or text her because he assumed that Brittany probably found someone else to hang out with for that night which is so odd because he was literally gone for five minutes to park the car. The police are definitely getting suspicious that Louis is you know aware of something that he's not telling them. A little bit of backstory on Louis slash Louise slash Louis because I've heard it pronounced all three ways when I was researching this video. Louis Perez was a 45 year old staff
staff sergeant in the Marines and he was a Marine for about 16 years as of 2012. Louis at the time was living on base with his wife and his 13 year old daughter. Louis said that he wasn't friends of Brittany and Corey Kilgore but he did just know them in passing because they lived on the same base. And also Brittany at the time was only 22 years old while Louis was 45 years old so like there would really be no reason for them to talk outside of the Marines. But the police can tell that Louis is obviously trying to downplay his relationship with Brittany or something because there's no way that Brittany would feel, you know, comfortable enough to go on a date with Louis, not really knowing who he is. And so I know what you're thinking. Why, you know, as I said, Louis is fully married with a whole child. So why is he going on a date with Brittany? Well, Louis's ex was actually interviewed by the police and Louis's ex would go on to say that Louis is a really big cheater and he cheated on his wife multiple times. She thinks that his wife is aware of his cheating but, but she doesn't think that his wife is aware of the extent of the cheating and the extent of the cheating is like insane. Louis was very much into like BDSM and role playing which isn't really that big of a deal like do what you want to do but with Louis he got scary and he didn't know when to stop and when they confiscated Louis's computer they actually found a couple of home videos where basically he was like filming sex tapes and stuff like that and he would go by the name Ivan but these videos kind of just seemed like borderline snuff films. There was this one video that the police found where he was beating a girl and the girl was begging him to stop but he didn't. He continued until the girl fell unconscious and he continued to beat her. So as they start investigating Louis a little bit more they find out that the extent of his cheating is not just you know going on dates or whatever. Louis had literally an entire other house with a girlfriend. His girlfriend was named Dorothy Margellino, and again, his wife had no clue about this whole other life that Louis was living. But at this house, he had what he called a sex dungeon where he would make all of these home videos at. But when the police got there, they found out that not only was Louis sharing this house with Dorothy, his girlfriend, they were also sharing this house with a woman who was Louis and Dorothy's like sex slave. Apparently Louis and Dorothy had met this girl named Jessica Lopez and did sort of like a Fifty Shades of Grey thing where they made her sign a contract basically saying that she hands her life over to them and from here on out she will like do everything that they tell her to do and they were pretty brutal to Jennifer. She literally had to sleep in a closet in the basement every single night. She was also forced to wear a dog collar 24 hours every day. And so for Jessica and uh, Dorothy, this was their entire life. This was a lifestyle for them. They lived at the house full time. But as for Louis, this was just sort of a fun thing that he did, you know, after work some days during the week and then on the weekends. So how did Brittany and Louis even meet in the first place? Well, for some reason, Brittany was actually friends with Dorothy. And so through Brittany, Brittany coming over to Dorothy's house one day when Brittany was over that is when Louie came over to the house to hang out with Dorothy and that is when Louie and Brittany met. Louie as soon as he met Brittany he grew very fond of Brittany very quickly. She was funny, she was smart. On top of all of that Louie loved that she was a goody-goody. He liked that Brittany was the type of girl that always played by the rules, that she was very polite, very respectful, and Louie weirdly liked that but Dorothy did not because Dorothy saw how close Louis and Brittany were getting and Dorothy grew extremely jealous and Dorothy would even go as far as calling Brittany quote the herpes and quote the disease and so the police are finding all this information out and so since they were now in possession of Louis's phone and Brittany's phone they attempt at tracking the locations of the two phones on the night that Brittany disappeared. Louis Louis had told the police that their dinner cruise was located in downtown San Diego about an hour away from Fallbrook, but when they looked at the locations of the phone on that night,
night, they found that both phones actually never left Fallbrook that night. And instead of going to the romantic dinner cruise that Louis had claimed they went on, they actually ended up going to Dorothy's house. And so when the police are telling Louis all of this, they're saying, you know, we know for a fact you guys never went to San Diego. We checked your phones. We know your locations. That's when Louis starts to, you know, realize that all of his lies are catching up with him. So he slowly starts to reveal the semi-truth of what happened that night. He says that a couple days before April 13th, the day that Brittany went missing, he was helping Brittany pack up all of her things because he was aware of Brittany and Corey's recent divorce. And as he was helping her pack up all of her things, that is when he had asked her out on a dinner cruise. And at first, Brittany said no because she was literally married to a man for three years and she barely, you know, got divorced. Like the divorce papers were just sent out. So like she's not ready to go on dates yet with everything being so fresh. But as I said earlier, Louis is the kind of guy that doesn't know when to stop and he doesn't know when to take no for an answer. So he tries it again and he goes, okay, well, what if I help you all day today and all day tomorrow getting all of your stuff out of here, then will you go on a date with me? And Brittany again says no. She's like, I am not ready to go on a date yet. I was just married for three years. This is very hard for me. But again, Louis can't take no for an answer. So he tries a third time and he goes, okay, what if I help you all day today and then you go on a date with me? And in exchange for that date, I bring over five of my biggest Marine friends and they all come over and all of us can help you pack up all your stuff so that you can get out of here as quick as possible. Now, this was a deal that Brittany liked because hiring movers can get kind of expensive, especially when you're going from California to Missouri. Like, that's quite a drive. And so, all the help that Brittany could get, she appreciated. So, to this, that is when Brittany agreed to go on the date. But as soon as Brittany agreed to go on this date, it was said that she just felt extremely weird about the situation to the point where she even called Dorothy and she asked Dorothy like, hey, Louis just asked me to go on this date and I'm not really sure like if I should, like, is that okay with you? Because I know you guys have like a three thing going on, but I don't know if he's supposed to be doing this. And Dorothy basically just tells Brittany like, yeah, that's fine. Like Louis is his own person. He can do what he wants to do. If you want to go on the date, you can go on the date. And so Brittany to this, you know, did feel a little bit better knowing that Dorothy was okay with it, but she still just had this weird gut feeling that she shouldn't go. And so she even talked to a couple of her other really close friends and all of her friends basically told her, you know, go have fun. You can do this. Like literally you are going to be eating on a cruise ship. Like even if the date is a bust and you're never going to go on another date with him, at least you got to eat for free on a cruise ship. Like that is a once in a lifetime experience. Also, you're leaving to Missouri in a couple of days. So again, like even if the date doesn't go well, it's not like you have to ever see him again. With all of this convincing, that is when Brittany had agreed to go on this date with Louis on the night of April 13th. Louie had picked her up from her home at 7.40 p.m. this night, and we know of this because there were a lot of neighbors in the area that had, like, security cameras outside their home or ring doorbell cameras, and so were able to track their movements. Louie picked up Brittany at 7.40 p.m., but we can tell pretty quickly that Brittany was feeling extremely uncomfortable because 10 minutes into the drive at 7.50 p.m., Brittany texts her best friend, and all it says, is help. 12 minutes later, that's when Brittany's friend texts back and says, quote, are you okay? And the next message says, quote, Brittany, are you okay? I'm freaking out here. And so after this, Brittany's friend attempted at calling and texting Brittany multiple times trying to get a hold of her. And then all of a sudden, Brittany sends a text back basically saying like, oh, sorry, I haven't been replying. I was just nervous. Like I'm out having drinks. I'm having so much fun. And that text that was sent off on Britney's phone would be the last text that was ever sent off on Britney's phone. 
As I said, this date happened on April 13th, and so when April 17th came around, that was the day of Brittany's flight, Brittany had missed her flight, and her family attempted at calling Brittany and texting Brittany, and there was no response. And so the police, with the timeline that they have right now, they're trying to figure out what exactly happened from the time of like around 8 p.m. on the 13th to when if Brittany missed her flight on the 17th, what happened during that gap or where Brittany's body even is. So the police had gotten a search warrant for Louis's car and literally just like laying out in his car is an AR-15 and when they ran the serial number they found that it was stolen and so when they found that this was stolen it was kind of like a big win for the police because that means they were able to arrest Louis and keep him for further questioning about Brittany. They also found bloody bags on top of bloody gloves and and when they ran testing on these bloody items, they came back positive for Brittany Kilgore's blood. They also found a stun gun with both Luis's and Brittany's DNA on it. They believe that the stun gun was used on Brittany at one point, but what happened to Brittany at Dorothy's house, that is what they are super unsure of because as I said, from tracking the locations on the phone, they knew that she was at Dorothy's house at one point, but what happened there specifically specifically, they are still very, you know, in fog about. They decide to go to the source and go to Dorothy and Jessica's house, but when police got there, they found that Dorothy and Jessica had actually fled the scene. They were not at the house, and it had looked like they had packed bags and left because a lot of their important items, like their passports, birth certificates, things like that, were completely gone. So that is when they sent out a wanted alert, basically just telling everyone if you see these two girls please notify the police immediately and this actually ended up helping because the very next day the police receive a phone call from someone at the Ramada Inn Hotel who says that they could have sworn they either saw Brittany or Jessica staying in one of the rooms. When the police got to the hotel they went to the room that this witness had said that they saw like Jessica or Dorothy in and when they walked in they indeed he did find Jessica, but Jessica was covered in blood because she had cuts all over her body, and it looked like maybe it was an attempt at suicide, yet there was no cuts near her wrists, and she was still breathing and conscious when the police got there. In the bathroom, there was a note that said, quote, pigs read this, and underneath this note was an eight-page letter detailing the final moments of Brittany's life. Now, the full eight pages from what I found is not online currently, but a few pages and a few transcripts have been leaked from this note, and so I'm basically just going to explain the parts of the note that has been released to the public. So basically what happened on the night of April 13th, Brittany was under the impression that she was going to go on this really nice dinner cruise with Louise. About 10 minutes into the ride, that is when Louis had told Brittany that they were planning on going to Dorothy's house instead of the dinner cruise. And Brittany felt kind of uncomfortable with this because she said, you know, I know that you and Dorothy have a thing and I just don't want to get involved. And so she asked Louis to turn around and go back to her house. But Louis refused to take her home and basically said, you know, you're going to Dorothy's house whether you like it or not. And so that is when Brittany had texted her friend help because she was freaking out that she wasn't able to go back home. After that help text message was sent off, that is when Brittany's phone location had rang that she was at Dorothy's house. And as that friend started to call and text Brittany multiple times, Brittany's phone was still at Dorothy's house. It was said that when Brittany got there, that is when she was at first stunned with the stun gun. And it was speculated from Brittany's body that Brittany was most likely tortured before her death. And so after, you know, whatever they did to her, that is when in the note it says that Jessica had strangled Brittany to death. When they realized that Brittany was dead, that's when all three of them had drove Brittany's body to a nearby lake called Lake Skinnier, and that is where they had dumped her body. And so the police show up to the area to investigate, and when they show up to the lake, that is unfortunately when they find the body of 22-year-old Brittany Kilgore. When they brought her body, 
body in for autopsy, they found that Brittany's body was most likely tortured with BDSM equipment and strangulation. And the reason why they believe that she was strangled is because she was found with ligature marks on her neck. She was found with bruises and defensive wounds as well as weirdly, a bunch of huge incisions around the joints of her body as if someone was trying to cut up her body but then gave up halfway. And so the police start doing a little bit more digging and what they find was that on April 13th, it was actually Jessica's birthday. And so now the police are kind of thinking that possibly Brittany was like a present to Jessica for her birthday. Jessica, Dorothy, and Louie were very into the lifestyle of BDSM and they did it, as I said, every single day. But when you're doing something every single day and it becomes so routine, it's very, very easy to get bored of it. And when you are bored of something like that, your only other option is to try to push the boundaries more and more to get that same exact thrill that you got when you did it for the very first time. But pushing the boundaries more and more can get extremely dangerous. And so, as I said, when Jessica was found, she was found with all these cuts all over her body. So she was immediately admitted into the hospital. But since the cuts were not fatal, as I said, there was none like on her wrists or anything else. It was mostly just like on her arms and legs and stomach. And so she was discharged from the hospital quite quickly. Although they got a hold of Jessica, Dorothy was still out there on the streets. And so they checked the security footage and they find that Dorothy actually left the hotel room 10 minutes before the police had showed up, meaning that when Dorothy had left, most likely Jessica was already cut up and the eight page note was already written. What if Dorothy had forced Jessica to write the note and basically just take the fall for her crime because she knew that the police were on their way? And they believe that, you know, Dorothy would do something like this because when speaking to both Louis and Jessica, as well as investigating the house, they kind of put the pieces together that Dorothy was the ringleader of the group. Dorothy was the one that called the shots and Dorothy was the one that basically took control of the household. When they were doing an investigation of the house, around the household, they saw little notes all over, such as like on the toilet paper roll, there was a little note that said under, not over, meaning that she was like telling everyone how to put the toilet paper. There was also instructions near every single in the house on how to clean the sink after you're using it. There were certain like cabinets and drawers that had labels on them that said, do not open without permission. Jessica and Louie would tell the police that those labels were put there by Dorothy. It's at this point where the police start slowly putting everything together. Like they know that Dorothy hated Brittany. So that means Dorothy has a motivation to kill Brittany. And then when Brittany shows up dead, Dorothy is nowhere to be found. So now the police are starting to speculate that since Dorothy was in the room when that uh, eight page note was wrote, it's believed that possibly Dorothy had told Jessica to write all of that note and basically take the blame and the fall for her own actions. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. The window was literally open. Sorry if you heard all of those birds. It's hella quiet now. Anyways, so they ended up tracking Dorothy's phone and what they found was that Dorothy Dorothy was actually in a small town in Virginia. And so the police contact Dorothy trying to get her to go back to California. Dorothy basically tells the police that she's not going back to California because they have no evidence against her. She is innocent until proven guilty. And so since she hadn't done anything, she technically doesn't have to go back to California. And so after this, the police still continue to search for Dorothy. Dorothy, and Dorothy was actually pretty good at hiding until she was found a couple weeks later back home in San Diego at a local hotel. And so when they found Dorothy, that is when they arrested Dorothy on suspicion to commit murder and murder. Now the trial for this is just as crazy as the story itself. Dorothy, Jessica, and Louie had the same exact trial, yet all of them 
them pled not guilty. Literally the entire trial, all they're doing is just pointing the finger at one another. The trial began back in 2015 and still at this point, it had been around two years since the incident and still no one really knew what happened that night on April 13th. Everyone knew that Louis, Jessica, and Dorothy did play a role in the murder of Brittany, but they weren't really sure what those roles were. And there was actually one point as well where Louis and Dorothy tried to team up against Jessica and basically say that Louis and Dorothy went out of the house at night, like on the night of April 13th. And then when they came back, they found that Jessica had strangled Brittany to death. And so technically they weren't even at the house when the murder happened, but that does not explain why there was a bloody gloves and bloody bags were found in the back of Louis's car with Brittany's blood on it. And then on top of that, his phone was tracked to be at Dorothy's house all night long. Louis's DNA was also found on the stun gun as well as Brittany's DNA. And how would Brittany's DNA even get on the stun gun if it was not used on her in the first place by Louis? They had labeled Louis as the ringleader or the master of this operation. And then Dorothy was the submissive wife while Jessica was their slave. The court attempted at arguing, specifically Jessica's team tried to argue that Brittany wasn't even at the house in the first place. They tried to say that at the house when they sweeped it, there was no like DNA or skin cells or anything to basically point Brittany to the house. The only thing that they had was the stun gun, which the stun gun like was not found in the house. It was found in Louis's possession, but that still does not explain the bloody like bag and bloody gloves that was found in his car. For just so many factors and so many questions, yet none of these three people were answering any of them. It was basically just all three of them not taking any accountability for their actions and just pointing the finger at anyone but themselves. It was believed that Jessica out of the three was getting abused by both Louis and Dorothy, which is very understandable if you look at Jessica's living situation. As I said, she wore a dog collar 24-7 and slept in a basement closet, like not even just a basement. And so it was clear all of the abuse that they were putting onto Jessica. And so it would make sense why Jessica would literally risk her freedom in order to help Dorothy and Louie. But in the end, all three of them, Louie, Brittany, and Dorothy were all charged with murder, torture, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, kidnapping, and attempted sexual battery. Each one of them got a life sentence without possibility of parole, and Louis actually had a chance to speak up at the court and towards Britney's family. And when you watch this clip, I want you to count the amount of times that Louis says sorry. I would like to take this time to thank my family and those friends that stood by me during this horrible and trying time. I appreciate your prayers, your love, and your compassion. I will never forget your kind words of encouragement. Those that know me know I have never raised my hand in anger at another soul. To those that at best turned their back on me, I have nothing but love and forgiveness for you. I forgive you all. As you guessed it, literally zero times. Louis does not acknowledge what he did at all. All he's saying is that he forgives everyone, which is crazy because he should not be forgiving anyone. He literally did the unforgivable. He says that he would never lift a hand out of anger in his life. And he thanks all of the people that stood by his side throughout all of this. But even if he, you know, hypothetically didn't commit this crime, crime, saying sorry to Britney's family for the loss of their daughter is the least you can do. As far as Dorothy and Jessica, they did have the opportunity, same as Louis, to speak to the court and speak to Britney's family, give their condolences, say sorry, whatever they really wanted to say, but both of them refused to talk. Even after that insanely crazy and confusing trial, even to this day, still no one really knows what 
what happened that night. No one knows if this was premeditated and Louis had planned this out, if it was a last minute thing. No one really knows if this was for Jessica's birthday or if it was just a coincidence that her birthday was that day. As for the aftermath of all of this, believe it or not, the aftermath is just as crazy as the story and the trial. Dorothy actually became a writer in prison. She wrote a book called My Inside Voice, which was a poetry book basically about like her life behind bars and how unfair the judicial system is, but all written in poetry. And I know you guys are dying to hear some of this woman's poetry. Now, I'm not going to read you everything because I would never want you to go through something like that. You can actually purchase the book, which I don't recommend, obviously, because you'd literally be giving your money to a murderer. And so I'm just going to read you some of her poetry because this poetry is probably the most tone deaf thing I've ever heard of in my life. The description of her book on Amazon says, quote, the poems, letters, and short stories will give you insight on the journey of myself and thousands of others that include experiencing birth, death, illness, joy, and despair while locked away from family and friends. The voice of this book echoes the voice of thousands of others who share these same experiences. The emotion is raw as I open up. Be prepared to laugh, cry, be outraged, motivated, and on occasion, dot, 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 hopeful. And most of her poems throughout the book basically just says, you know, something along the lines of prison sucks, everyone give me sympathy because I'm living the worst situation. And another really important factor is that through her poetry, she says that she's in prison, but not once does she mention what she's in for. She never once says that, you know, I'm guilty for what I did or I'm sorry for what I did. All she talks about is how much she wants to leave and how, you know, disrespected she is in there. She never ever mentions that she literally tortured and murdered an innocent woman out of jealousy. And so this is one of her poems and it's titled Prison Laughter. Prison laughter is hard to hear. It is usually at the expense of others. I hear laughter and I cringe with dread. Laughter used to be associated with joy. Everyone joined in the pleasure events. Now I look around for the targeted victim, fearing that it is most likely me again. Laughter in prison is rarely without a victim. So I'm assuming Dorothy just got bullied in prison and now she's like, oh, it, laughing used to be so much fun. It's not as fun when it's at you. And she feels super mad that she's getting bullied in prison because it's prison. And surprisingly, that's not even the worst one because there's another one titled, quote, I had a life. I had a perfectly imperfect family once, but I didn't really appreciate them. I had friends that saw the real me once, but I didn't see them through. I had a future full of opportunity once, but I didn't take the open doors. I had a home that was built on love once, but I didn't live in that love. I learned too late I had a life, and by then it was too late, for it was gone." You mean you killed someone and you went to jail for it? Oh my. And so the last poem that I'm gonna read you, I feel like I need to read you because again, it's just the most tone deaf thing. And you can definitely tell that Dorothy has no sympathy for what she did and does not regret it at all. Or she just doesn't see the bad in what she did. Because this last poem is called, quote, My Cell. My cell is where the state says I am assigned. My cell is where I seek sanctuary from prison. My cell is where I lay my head to sleep at night. My cell is where I cry out to my God and pray. My cell is where I read messages from home. My cell is where I mourn all deaths and losses. My cell is where I celebrate life's little victories. My cell is where I relive my mistakes and failures. My cell is where I hang mementos to remember. My cell is where I do my best to forget the past. My cell is where the state says I live until I die. My cell is more than a cell. It is my home. Dot 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 
for now. Does this woman literally think she's getting released? And does this woman really think that like she's just gonna be able to leave? She was charged with not just murder, but torture, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, kidnapping, and attempted sexual assault. Five charges and she just believes that all of them are gonna be dropped because she's like misunderstood. Not only has she written poetry, but she's also written other things such as essays, letters, and articles. She's also a contributing writer at the Prisons Journalism Project and basically all of her articles are just again her complaining about how prison sucks and she wishes that she can be released and hopefully one day she will be. And crazily enough it doesn't stop there. Dorothy not only had written a whole poetry novel but she on top of that tried to get into the dating scene. She basically went on like this pen pal website and was pitching her for like dating and for like future spouses. Her bio for her dating profile says, quote, I am a 47 year old journalist and author in prison. I am seeking interesting and open minded people to have conversations with and get to know. My published works and books are a great way to get to know me. I am a textbook Gemini and have learned to embrace all sides of myself. In the past, I was a preacher's kid and now I am a prisoner. Correction, I was a preacher's kid and then I murdered someone and now I'm in prison facing the consequences of my actions. In the past, I was a corporate trainer slash project manager for a Fortune 400 tech company and now I am an inmate clerk making 11 cents an hour. I am not ashamed of the past or the present. It is simply parts of me. I love people, but hate being around them. I love retail therapy, but I'm not materialistic. In quotations, I love to share. I love the law, but hate how it's used. I love God, but hate how he is used. I believe in the criminal justice system, but believe that it is broken. If you would like to email me, go to www.gettingout.com and create an account. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So as you can tell from that, she uh, once again, as of today in 2023, is not taking any accountability for her actions. She's not even mentioning what her charges are. And honestly, I don't even know if she like believes that she's innocent because she never even mentions her crime in general. Like she's not sitting there saying that she wants justice because she's not guilty. She just instead pretends as if it didn't even happen. And she's just, you know, like a victim of the criminal justice system, which I think is extremely disrespectful to literally everyone involved, not just Britney's family and Britney herself, but also Corey as well. Corey was her husband of three years that had to come home from Afghanistan to his dead wife. Like, that is such a traumatizing thing to go through. And the fact that Dorothy continues to paint herself as the victim is so disgusting on every single level. And as I said, she is facing five different charges. So it's not like, you know, it was a misunderstanding. As for Dorothy and Louis though, they have stayed completely silent since all of this happened. As far as I know and as far as I have seen, they haven't really done much. They've basically just been in prison serving out their life sentence. And I think what's really sad and frustrating about this situation, even to this day, is that we still have no clue what happened because the three of them, you know, it wasn't just Dorothy. It was Louis and Jessica as well. They were equally involved in the torture and murder of Brittany as Dorothy was. I mean, all three of them helped in disposing of her body. None of them went to the police. None of them said anything to anyone. I think that's another really important thing to mention that although Dorothy and the way that she's handling the situation is disgusting, we shouldn't forget that Jessica and Louis are also just equally to blame. But yeah, that is the end of today's case. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, all of that will be linked down below, as well as my P.O. Box. If you want to send me 
anything and as well as well all of the makeup that I put on my face so if you're wondering what this eyeshadow look is what this lip is all of that will be linked down below and I would also love to hear what you guys think about the case in the comments below I love reading your guys's like comments and opinions about everything and also if you go ahead and do your own research about the case and you find something that I didn't find in my research or that I simply did not mention make sure to leave that in the comments below because I'm pretty sure everybody would love to hear what you have to say there's so many unanswered questions about this case do you think Dorothy is more to blame for this situation than Louie and Jessica or do you believe they all had equal parts do you believe that Jessica was actually the one that strangled Brittany or do you think that she was just taking the fall for Dorothy's actions do you believe that all of them should be locked up for the rest of their lives or do you think that they should at least have a second chance at life let me know what you guys think leave all of that in the comments below um I also want to apologize once again for leaving the window open for half of the video it was probably really loud and also the smoke from the incense there was just a lot of stuff going behind the camera that like I needed to fix throughout the video so sorry about all of that again yeah that is all from me I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day make sure to go outside get some fresh air be safe out there and as always I love you I love you I love you and do something that makes you happy today.